You are watching the Big Dog Post Game Show, brought to you by Viner Forgates and the Big Dog himself, Rick Jacklich at the Jacklich Law Group. Good evening and welcome to the Big Dog Post Game Show. Oregon 39, Maryland 18. I'm Wayne. That's Mason. There's a lot to talk about, some of it good, most of it really frustrating. Mason, what did you see out there? Yeah, I saw a, definitely a more inspired performance than I expected uh, at this point in the season. And look, I'll go right on to the, not really the this game side of it, but the bigger picture side of it. The effort that Maryland seems to find when they're playing the number one, number five, number eight team in the country is clearly different than what we saw two weeks ago in Minneapolis, um, a couple weeks before that against Northwestern. But the big-name programs bring out the best in the Terps tonight. They could not beat the Travel, the Oregon Ducks, or the referees. And too many mistakes, too many errors, but the game was definitely there. Yeah, sometimes you talk about a basketball game being like eight on five because of the refs. But looking at football, does that make it uh, 19 to 11? With the refs being on Oregon's side, that's too many guys to cover. Yeah. You can go over the mistakes or the questionable calls, and to me it, it looks like an old-time uh, Duke-Maryland basketball game where you just couldn't get a call. Well, I, I, think that, I think that everybody that watched this game was displeased with the ref. I mean, credit to Oregon. They took the game. You know, the fake punt worked out in their favor. Then then nobody really made big plays in this football game, but Oregon found a way. I mean, some, some of the calls, you know, they're just, they're, they're just clear um, misses by the refereeing crew in the sense of, you know, the, the fumble return for the touchdown, I feel like being the biggest one where you pointed out to me, um, you know, the ref that Nolan Ray has direct contact with is waving. That's an incomplete pass. Yes, it is a, clearly a fumble, the referee that has the call on the field is calling an incomplete pass. That's why no Maryland player really even attempts the tackle. If you watch the first 10 seconds of the return and, and you know, th there's a 75 yard return. That ball should be moved back to that. And, and then this Oregon team, I mean, should be moved back to the spot. It was recovered because at that point, the ball's dead. And after a clear recovery, the ball is where it's, it's recovered. So, yeah, it's about 60, 70 yards back, but certainly not a touchdown. The second play. Yeah, I mean, and then I was just going to comment on the on the defensive back play and just overall Dan Lanning's strategy, seemingly at this point, in in where, where things are for the Oregon Ducks and being one of the best teams in the country. These corners, I mean, they dare refs. You watch them week in, week out. They dare the referee to call pass interference, a hold, illegal contact every single play and basically bank on it not being called. And, and today, again, Works out in their favor. They're knocking Ty Felton over 10 yards down the field on crucial plays. No call. I mean, they're not going to call it every single time. A and you just, you find a way to to win games that way. And on the field goal attempt, the guy's clearly going off sides to give Maryland the five yards to ask Maryland to go for it on fourth and nine. It's a better situational win for Oregon. I would kick the field goal there. I don't I don't like our chances on, on fourth and nine, but look. If you want to look at the positives, the offensive line much better. Lakai well, Roland. Well, well, get... Before you go off of the referees, the one that got the most uh, Twitter heat was the tight end who was out of bounds in the end zone. They look at it, and you know it's still a touchdown, which I don't believe the call, but we're talking about a play where you're already down on, I believe it was the seven-yard line. So, yeah, that was a little more evident because even the announcers didn't pick up on the fact that the ref called the fumble as an incomplete pass and should have been dead, but they certainly had 10 looks at the tight end Ferguson going out of bounds. Yeah, they, they did. And, and look, this one goes in a stack of plays this year for Maryland that have been those crucial moments in these games where the, the calls just have not gone our way. I mean, you go back to Indiana where we have clear footage of Caden Prather scoring a touchdown I believe that play was called a touchdown on the field, then overturned. Um, same sort of situation right there. End of, or that one's, you know, later in the game, maybe even in the fourth quarter of that game, turns yeah. that one into a seven-point game. That swings that game. 
out of control. This one does the same thing, but look, if you take the games that Maryland's been in that are similar to this one, 2021 Penn State at home, I feel like this was basically watching that game over, uh, 2022 Michigan on the road in the Ohio State game later in that same year, the four-minute defense for Maryland um, it has cost them each and every one of these football games. Last year, you go to our closest attempt against one of these teams, the game at home against Michigan, and Jay Sean Barham picks a pass off in the end zone with like 30 seconds left in the half that keeps the game in within reach. So clearly, I mean, Brian Williams has done a good job in his time at Maryland, but that that gap, that middle eight that Loxley has constantly talked about this year, again, failure in those moments to take the game. And it, it's just, it's been the entire season. Except this time the wheels didn't come all the way off and we didn't give up like 27 fourth quarter points like the Northwestern game. Nope. So two more spots before we go to the good part. Maryland gets the ball back 20 seconds to go in the second quarter. Even before they come out on the field, I'm don't, do not just come out and take a knee. You've got three timeouts. You're trying to win a game. You're down 21 to 10. And the other team gets the ball coming out of the half. You have to try one or two passes, you're losing the game anyhow. You got to do something. Maryland comes out and takes the knee, flips the ball up and walks away, and there goes another potential chance. And then the one that probably got me to actually throw my phone was the pass interference call in the end zone. It could have been on Perry Fisher, where the ball was thrown maybe in the area of the receiver. The Maryland defensive back runs in the wide receiver and Boom, there's a PI. I it's usual. Well, the cannot selective, believe the they selective, call that. The selective choice things and not having coached football, but having coached other sports that are very, very um within, I guess, the judgment call of the ref on a on a play to play basis. Um is like if that's pass interference, then the grounding call can't be grounding. They're the same distance of ball away from it. And look, I know that Oregon fans, they're gonna have a ton of possibly in the comments of this, you know, a ton of like the, the non roughing the passer call on Kellen White. How is that not roughing the passer? Now the guy pushes him over. That's a 15 yard penalty, but the guy takes two steps. The guy's on the, you know, his foot's on the white Dylan Gabriel and Kellen White levels him out of bounds. The ref's staring right at the play. How is that not a penalty? I mean, it, these are judgment calls by this refereeing crew that were just a mess. One, the, sure, you can argue with all of this. It's what makes sports fun. And even with all that, I'm not sure Maryland's winning the game. I'm not no. saying Maryland lost the game because of that. But Maryland needed those calls to win the game. And the fact that they didn't call roughing on Kellen Wyatt really doesn't affect the game. But if they don't call that a fumble touchdown return, it affects the game. If they don't call that long pass P.I., could actually affect the game and certainly affects the spread. I'll give you that much because a couple, you know, one score or the other, it didn't get to 24 and a half. No. But it got close. It got close. So we're going to have a word from Kevin Willard and Rick Jacklitz right here. And then we'll be back to talk about the good things that we saw in Oregon. So, Turp fans, if your family's injured in a car crash, you'd be barking mad not to call Rick and the Big Dogs at the Jack Litch Law Group at 855-BIG-DOG-1. But as you know, Coach, it's not the last win, it's the next win that's so important. And that's why we continue to hustle, continue to work so hard for all of our clients to earn that name, the Big Dogs from the small firm. Just like you do. You get your guys hustling all the time. That's why we love you, Rick. And most of all, go, go Terps. Terps! All right, back in the Viner Four Gates Turp Talk Studios. There were some good things, uh, and I, I will start. Well, you know what? You take this one. Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing that we saw from this game is, is overall health of the team coming out of the bye week. Dante Trader being back on the field, which puts Jalen Husky back in his spot, which made an immediate impact. I think Lakai Rowland, one of those freshman corners that finally got his shot, you know, he, he looked like a stable corner number two for this team uh, most of the game. Uh, that that has to be the biggest positive. And then on the offensive line side, I think Tamarcus Walker coming in 
um, and sort of showing that there is maybe something that's not quite these true freshmen, some gap filling offensive linemen that are serviceable here in the middle as as we start to kind of look at the at the end of this year into next year. Um, Therese Davis, Walker, they they can play. So I think that that starts to sure things up there um, going forward. And, and Octavian Smith has really, really come on here uh, down the stretch, giving the Terps some certainty a wide receiver. Going from what you just said, having Glenn Miller back as a corner, and you said Husky, so you have Glenn Miller, Husky, you have Labian Scruggs and Trader at safety, and suddenly you got four guys back there that can play. Uh, I think the fellow you were talking about, is that number 27? Yeah. So he had a pretty good game. Perry Fisher still hit or miss there. And Jacobs at safety, who went out weeks ago and just hasn't come back. So there's some missing pieces, but that was better. Uh, on the offensive line, I heard that Hershey, I think he wore 61, can really play at center, and they're going to need a center for next year because this is Colton Berger's one-and-done campaign at Maryland, and it was good enough. Uh, Billy? Well, no, it hasn't been good enough. It, it hasn't. This offensive line has not been good enough, and I think when you look at this game and you look through the tape and, you know, you're starting to look at Twitter and the boards and, you know, Billy Edwards sucks is all over the place. The guy, I mean, they try and say it on the broadcast, but they don't really have usable stats, seemingly. I mean, this BTN broadcast was an absolute disaster. And, you know, Jake Butts been on the podcast with us, and I really like him, but it was terrible. Um, they say, you know, he's one of the most hit guys in the conference. If he's not the most hit quarterback at this point in major college football, I mean, I don't I don't know who is. I, I don't well, think... It's I almost agree. like the line's not good enough to judge any other aspect of the offense other than the roster construction by the coaching. The stat they used as a positive, which is actually a negative, is he gets the rid of the ball, and as they were saying that, I'm thinking 2.1 seconds, and they come back 2.2. You, you can't have real football plays, passing plays, in two seconds. It just doesn't work. And it's not because Maryland wants to go that fast. It's because if they go any slower, the quarterback gets killed. And I know you can make comparisons that Leah was this, Leah was better. Leah had some pro offensive linemen. If Talia Tungvialoa is the quarterback on this team, he probably makes it through three games before he's on IR. The difference with Billy is he takes those hits, and you can see he is much slower. He takes off running, and you can break out a calendar to time him. He used to be quick. They, they beat the heck out of him. Even coming off a bye week, he still looks awfully slow. It's not, does he hit the same slant, uh, slant patterns? Does he have the same deep ball? No, but he can stay in there and take this beating. Maybe just because he's beat up, you might have to see some MJ Morris because you got to win the next two games. And even though Rutgers beat Minnesota today, Iowa lost at UCLA, it's not impossible to come back if you played like you did tonight against those two teams with neutral refereeing, you probably can win those two games at home. I'm not saying you will, but you could. Well, now you have to. And I will say I like this team more in desperation moments when it is the last game. If you look at the bowl games, say whatever you will about bowl game, you know, college football at this point. But in desperation moments, uh, this team, this program under Michael Oxley, when there is no tomorrow, the five and six Maryland against the five and six Rutgers games, they, they've shown up fully prepared, fully ready, fully a team, all the snaps. And look, that's what I'm going to expect to see uh, next Saturday against Rutgers. That's what I'm going to expect to see the following Saturday against Iowa. It is, you know, it's it's now or never. You know, the back's up against the wall uh, right now. And that that sort of intensity, I felt like, started um, you saw it in the USC game where they really felt like they needed to win that game. I felt like you saw a lot of it tonight, and that's what leads to competition in these games. But in the next two weeks, it's teams on or below our talent level, and we got to have it. There is there is no other way. There Really, when you look at the grand scheme of things, you do not. We're going backwards win-wise, but you don't want to go backwards to non-bowl participation-wise. So... Um, 
that's that's kind of where I'll leave it. I mean, the the effort was there, but the roster construction is just it's just not there. We're not at the level of the number one team in the country, and I highly suggest that maybe our coach stops saying that we're at that level before every season because it just sets an expectation that he can't meet. And as a leader and CEO of this football program, setting unobtainable goals is probably not the best position you want to put yourself six years into your role. Well, that's a very nice way of saying who in the world looked at this team and went, hey, we're winning this. We're winning this thing. We're com- it, it, The players just aren't there. It's Even if you don't want to make it anybody's fault, it's just not there. One follow-up on that is you heard it on the broadcast. Once again, not the greatest broadcast of all time, this young team. Yeah, there's some young offensive linemen and a few cornerbacks that played, but most of this team is not young. And when you talk about desperation, it is the last hurrah for, it's probably Trader, it's probably Miller, it's Hippolyte, yeah. it's probably Aking Basote, Taishe Johnson, uh, Quayshon well, Fuller. You, you go down the list, a Ty Felton, he's done. Yeah, and th- that's one of the things that, um, you know, I look at the the lacrosse helmet over your head, the Jacksonville one, I feel like a lot of similarities from my Dolphins and my time with them to like what you're looking at at Maryland now. You know, there was a year there where it was like, if we don't win now, it's going to be another three years before we have another shot to make the tournament. And we yeah. fell a game short. And it was, you know, everybody's gone. All, like, 90% of the scoring on that team's gone. That's what you almost look at this football team and say. You can say a team is young because every team has seniors when, like, all the bright spots are the young guys and they don't show up one week or they don't show up or they're not at that level of competition. But you look at our production, and now that they've finally done what I think a lot of the fans are pushing for, and it's, like, all Ty Felton, Kane Prather, and Octavian Smith. Those are three you know, veteran junior red shirt and beyond players for this football team. You know, you see your senior bowl or the shrine bowl invites come out this week. And it's a picture on Maryland social media of Dante Trader and Glenn Miller with their invites for it. And you start to look past that at the weak spots of this team and the strong spots and say, we better figure something out. We either need to dominate in the portal, which in the NIL era is probably not where we want to try and make ourselves competitive or we got to, you know, something's got to give here because our guys that are producing for us, this is it. And you look at a guy like Roman Hemby and you could say that might be it for Roman Hemby. He has another year, but will he take it? You know, he was on the radar last year, or if he even does have another year, it's almost impossible to tell with these guys. But yeah, you look at who's playing and who's competing at the level that competed in the game tonight. And there's not a lot short of like Mike Harris, Daniel Wingate that are really ready to go right so i'll go maybe one or two more things one thing as i shift over there's a helmet up here that white ops helmet over my shoulder that is my favorite alternate uniform i know bruce hates uniform talk so we'll do this at the end did you like the uniform Uh, i love them i think they're different i think everyone's kind of caught up to us with our progressions you know they don't have stuff quite as crazy uh, as what Maryland has, but I thought what we wore tonight was different. Yeah, I almost felt like it might have been a little bit of a slight to Nike because it looked like the old Nike Pro Combat sort of look with the numbers. But you know, I'll leave that for the Under Armour guys to you know make that statement when they want to. Um, no, I really I did I did like it. It was something different. You know, it, it was clean and. It, it it definitely it caught it caught eyes around the national picture. But what I don't like about the Under Armour partnership is, you know, Maryland gets everything first, then all the other Under Armour schools get their version of it. So um, maybe this is one that just stays Maryland. And with that, I think we will wrap it up. Um, Monday night, you got basketball, Florida A&M comes to Xfinity Center. Friday night, a big one, Marquette rolls in Xfinity Center. And then so we'll see you after those games. And 6 o'clock, season on the line next Saturday night. The Rutgers Scarlet Knights come to Xfinity Center. Congratulations to Indiana to be 10-0. Congratulations to the Oregon Ducks. Despite my 
uh, misgivings with the referees. They did go out and beat Maryland by 21 points, however they got there. And they, they look like they're on the road to 12-0. and 0. And big game next week, I guess, I think it's next week, Indiana-Ohio State be a huge game to see if Indiana can get their first. Today was their first ever 10-win season. Next week would, would be a miracle if they could beat Ohio State. Mason, anything to wrap up with? No, we'll see you next week from CQ and throughout the week uh, at the Xbox. <laughs> Xbox, you got it. Thanks for watching the Big Dog Post Game Show. We will see you on Monday.